Uh, I wanted to introduce some of our panels very quickly. They'll be introducing themselves here on, on, on this panel as well. Uh, we have Bianca Sanen from uh, uh, the co-owner and operator of Paradise Books and Bread in Miami. Uh, we have Eric Su, uh, owner of Coast and Valley Wine Bar in New York City. Uh, we have Kevin Lawler, the executive director of Good Work Austin. Um, and we have Chris Renfro, a winemaker of 280 Project out in San Francisco. Um, leading the talk this afternoon will be Roxy Narvez. She's the wine educator at Turning Tables and the beverage director at Chloe in New Orleans. Please give them a wild, warm welcome to talk about what it is to be in business. I think we need one more chair. Are you good to stand? Hi, everyone. I'm going to be transparent. This is my first time moderating a panel. In fact, my first panel ever was, <laughs> was at um, ABV, Anything But Vinifera. And this conversation is actually powered by ABV. Anything But Vinifera is a, uh, a conference that it centers the uh, production of wine from non-European fruits. It can be forage fruit, it can be hybrid grapes, it can be native grapes, it can be rice, um, it can be flowers, it can be tea. Um, and it also is a very big space for decolonizing and decentering ourselves from capitalism. And so um, in that prompt earlier today, we, um, when Melon and Mine started this out earlier today, um, they asked us to um, create an intention, and then they asked us to say the, um, the what, the why, and the how. And so my what today was, I am here to help Bianca, Chris, Kevin, and Eric tell the story of their visions and how we can create a world both in business practices and in our communities that is about social good. The why is because I am here to present myself authentically. <clears throat> and to allow myself to accept the love and praise that I deserve for my presence in the space. And lastly, the how is that I will allow myself to be vulnerable and open to the people in this space because I am safe here. And I don't use that word safe lightly. All right, so um, further to that, um, we are going to start out with the conversation of social good. And uh, just for everyone, we already did this, but breathe, you got this. I'm just telling myself that right now. <laughs> um, Social good. What is the definition of social good? Um, taking care of each other. Obviously, that is the first thing. Social being community, human, society. Taking care of each other good is a good thing. And then also profits over power. Um, and profit is not power. <clears throat> profit is not power. Profit is a term that realistically it takes its nature from taking away from the Good of the community, it's, it's, it's singularity of one, one entity, one person, one group, taking the leftovers or the excess and not feeding them back into the community, but usually keeping for self. And we know that that is a huge problem. Um, and then also the intention of community over consumerism and also uh, being able to create a community where we have a conversation about solidarity economics rather than capitalists consumption. So I want to start everybody off with this question. Um, and I want to start it off because the, the one thing that really, really stuck out to me more than anything about my conversation with Eric was about the concept of people first in his business practices. Um, why do you, but why do you consider that social good is considered radical in a business practice? If you want to start that off. Um, yeah, I mean, first I wanted to uh, give some credit where credit is due. You can see in the picture of my partner business partner and life partner, Stephanie Watanabe. She really is the one who's been spearheading and, and driving this whole education um, for both of us and our business. And I think it's so radical because sometimes we almost feel like big problems require complicated solutions. And then so when you start to dial it back to the simplest truth, and all of a sudden it's like, there's no possible way that the answer is that easy. And so for us, um, it really was that easy. It was all driven by this concept, um, what we call people first. And so it could work in any uh, multiple different ways. In our, uh, at our wine bar, what we do, we kind of have three different groups of people. The producers, 
So we have uh, now 100% of our um, wine list is con uh, consists of 100% POC women LGBTQ winemakers. And now when it comes to the internal uh, team, then you know there are also people. And how we take care of them is we do not let the customer put value on our team members. So we got rid of tipping, uh, which has an entire terrible history of it. You know, feel free to learn about it online. It's all free. And, and then finally, um, you know, our guests, you know, there are people as well. And how we try to help them um, is that at, at our own expense, we, we know wines are already intimidating enough. And so how we wanted to solve that problem, we literally offer when we first opened 150 bottles all by the glass. So you can literally try 150 wines before you even decide on which glass you wanted to get. Um, so that's how we really just, you know, you focus on the people first, because at the end of the day, business is not business, uh, it's not about money. It really is about relationship building. Um, and so if you start to look at every single, um, if, you, if you start to look at people, then it really just becomes so much simpler. Chris? Yeah, I would say that, um, hmm. Yeah, it feels very simple, but like also complex at the same time. I think that it's radical in the way that we've gotten very far away from how we treat each other in a positive way. We see each other as, uh, yeah, profit. You know, how can we get over on each person rather than how can we work together? How can we all come up at the same time? And I think that's where the problem really kind of starts. You know, it's like we don't have a base for making sure that everyone is okay. I think all the time about how um, if one of us is not good, then none of us are good, you know, because we, we harbor that. We keep that kind of energy inside. Like, we can feel the stress of making sure that other people don't have as much as we have, you know what I mean? That you can, you can really feel that internally, and it, and it comes out in other ways. Um, and I think that it's that village mentality that I was talking to you about. I, I see the city that I live in as a village and that, you know, if you think about villages of the past and stuff, you had your elders, you had your youth, you had everyone from different generations that take care of each other, pass down knowledge, pass down resources. And it seems like we've really broken that system. But if you're able to kind of think about your community like that, like a village, then you wouldn't let anybody suffer. You would make sure that everybody has everything they need and we already have it. You know, money is something that we, we make up. We can put the value on anything we want to. It, it's just up to us to really, like, not really go that way. You know what I mean? Kevin, I want you to jump in, and then Bianca. Yeah, I mean, I think we try to, so my organization, Good Work Austin, we try to make it that socializing good in business is not radical. Like, we try to change that. That um, It only is because it's like for so many things you're told, uh, by society, I guess, like, you're supposed to do this, or you're supposed to do that, or business works this way, or you have to do this, and this is how everyone has always done this, uh, and we're trying to make it easier for people to say, I'm going to do it a little bit differently, and I'm going to do it a little bit better, and I'm going to do it in a way that uh, prioritizes something else, and prioritizes community, and prioritizes people, and, um, you know, hopefully it's less and less radical when, instead of one business, you know, changing the system or eliminating tipping, suddenly there's a wave of them, and it's just, that becomes how you do things. It changes the culture completely. Bianca. Um, so I can, I feel comfortable most, I guess, like speaking about my own personal experience and what it is that we do and how that sort of falls outside of, I guess, of a traditional framework of a business. Um, our shop is a cafe, it's a radical bookstore, and it's a natural wine bar and wine shop and it's um, owner-operated. So we are the ones that kind of run the place on a day-to-day -day basis. But because of that, we are able to prioritize social good. Like we are kind of like the people who can make all the decisions. And so we say, all right, what is the thing that we are prioritizing? And we prioritize access. We prioritize people, not just ourselves. We also prioritize our customers and the people who come in and choose to come in. And we say, hey, you can 
be here. We're not really like looking to get anything out of you. If anything, we want to offer you this experience. Um, and money is kind of like at, it's off to the side. It's not necessarily like, okay, we want to see how much money we can get out of you when you come in. And so that alone, that kind of like existence where you're not trying to exploit labor from employees, you're not trying to gouge money from, from customers and you're just kind of trying to create the sort of space that can exist where people are prioritized in really kind of like minuscule ways that when you zoom out, it becomes like sort of like macro way of like, oh, I know I can come here and feel really comfortable or feel safe or feel like no one's trying to get anything from me in, in both directions. And I feel like that that is a radical concept for a business, I think. I'm so glad you brought that up because that actually brought up a memory that was really interesting. So one more time to revisit ABV. Um, so the organizers are Jade Marley, um, Justine Bell, who's here in the audience today and will be speaking later, and um, Giuliani Gomez. And uh, Giuliani and their partner, Dante Clark, um, do a really awesome pop-up in New York called Pre-Shift. And they did our opening party um, at the ABV that we did in Miami in parody in Bianca's um, book and bread shop. So that night when we did the poetry reading, um, there was an amazing person that came up named Micah, and they shared a beautiful poem. The pro it was a poem prompt that said to uh, take, a, t take something that made you laugh and make a poem out of it. And a lot of people went into these really, really interesting places. Uh, Micah, in the place of feeling safe and, and being vulnerable, because Paradise was created for that because it centralized social good, they were able to also put out the ask of saying, and I'm raising money for top surgery. And it was a really gorgeous moment where that social good was able to assist a person in real time. Um, but, you know, we, uh, you did also mention that, like, you know, pr profit isn't your, your priority. However, we live in late stage capitalism. And how is it that you, I want to continue with you, how is it that you choose to unprioritize this or actively work to dismantle it in that? Yeah, so obviously as a sort of radical space, um, the books we carry, the things that we think about and talk about, um, to kind of answer it in two parts. One, I think, you know, dismantling capitalism sounds scary and impossible. Um, but if you break it down, dismantling just means taking apart a structure into smaller pieces, right? And capitalism is the sort of economic system that we're a part of, um, where private ownership um, of the means of production, um, private ownership of the means of production uh, to value profit, kind of like for, to, to, to make profit, the most amount of profit possible um, through the extraction of labor. Like that's kind of what capitalism is and that's what dismantling is. So rather than saying when we first opened, we were like, okay, how do we become this like anti-capitalist place? We're gonna get the radical books, we're gonna get the wine, we're gonna do the natural wine, like we're gonna you know, break through. And instead of kind of focusing on that as like the sort of destination, it becomes this sort of part of the journey of you know, how do we operate in a way to break it down a little bit. And so obviously part one is the worker owned situation that we, we put ourselves in where we were, you know, originally five, now four, um, owners of an establishment where we do everything ourselves. We, and everything is make the food, order the wine, you know, do the bookkeeping on a day to day, clean the floors, do the dishes during service, bust the food, all of the things that require several hands, we try to do it ourselves. Um, we're not, I'm not a CPA, so I can't do that, but you know, as much as we can, we kind of do everything ourselves. And what that allows us to do is to have our prices be as inexpensive as possible, right? So for people, what that means, when we talk about access and what's a priority for us is having everything on the menu for food be less than $10. There's not a single item on our food menu that costs $10. Um, that's something that's been our practice since we opened. And what that does is offer the space as a conduit of people to be able to get together and not feel like this sort of inaccessible place. Like, oh, they have an incredible wine list, they have all these great wines, but like, I can't afford to be there, so like, I'm not gonna go there. Um, so that, including with the sort of conversations that we encouraged people to have, with the book talks that we have, with ABV, with these sort of kind of like, out of the realm of traditional values, I guess, for a business, is the way that we can kind of start the, the journey of dismantling capitalism in our own way. Kevin. 
Kevin, I would love to take for you to take up on that. So you, up, so um, Good Work Austin, which is a local nonprofit um, that does education and collaborates with businesses in the hospitality industry, actually started before the pandemic. I would say 2016, I think was the, the, the time that you mentioned, and you are a 501c3. So I want to ask you a little bit more about how you operate in capitalism as a 501c3. Yeah, so yeah, our, our organization started pre-pandemic, um, changed a lot over the course of time. But for us, it is, uh, you know, we are a 5-1-C-3 nonprofit. So this, it's easier for me than anyone else up here that uh, I don't actually worry about profit at all. Um, and, but it is challenging, obviously, to fund our organization. And we do support uh, a couple hundred different restaurants, bars, coffee shops in Austin that are part of our network. And all of those businesses are operating in, in this system. And for us, it's, um, you know, trying to help them be the best that they can when they want to do something different and above and beyond what is normal. So we provide uh, free trainings for them. So any business in our network can be uh, can access free sexual harassment prevention training, uh, making sure that not only do you try to make that not happen in your space, but uh, if it does happen, if a customer comes in and something happens, like you know how to respond to it. Free de-escalation training, uh, free DEI training. Um, so making sure that these spaces are better uh, and trying to make it easier for the business owners in our network to exist in the system that we have, um, to make sure that their businesses are sustainable, because uh, it is hard to them, for them to afford some of these things. So uh, we really try to make sure that, that, you know, it's hard enough for what these businesses have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, financially. Uh, and we try to make it as easy as possible for them to do the good that they want to do by trying to kind of pool together, support them. We try to raise money from outside sources um, so that we can uh, make life easier for the businesses that want to do better. So Chris, um, you kind of operate from a completely different standpoint. You're pretty grassroots. You're pretty, you're pretty left that even. So um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your experience at 280 and Alamini Farms? And so for everyone who doesn't know, we have uh, the opportunity to grow grapes in San Francisco. My partner and I uh, spearhead and steward a very tiny vineyard uh, right next to a lower income neighborhood. Um, and with that, you know, we were able to kind of take this village mentality and think about it. Like, what do people need in this city? How do we show people how to change when we really don't have much? You know what I mean? It's not like we come from money or anything like that. Uh, working in restaurants was literally out of necessity. Um, it was the way that I could make the most money. Uh, I got into wine because that's how I can make even more money. Um, farming and agriculture has always been something that I've loved. Being outdoors is necessary, especially as being a person of color. Um, it's something that I really appreciate and feel like a privilege, um, especially when you see this lower income neighborhood and seeing how much it actually isn't used by some of the people of color in this neighborhood. It's like this, uh, this idea basically came about as a way to be like, how can we do as much good as we can with nothing? So these 65 vines, they're not ours, Pinot Noir. Uh, we took them, we basically started thinking about who do we know in the industry that would al align with this kind of idea of educating people um, and we basically talked to Steve Mathiason, an organic grape grower and winemaker out in California. Uh, we talked to Beth Forestrell, who is a professor at UC Davis. Uh, we came together and basically thought of how can we go from different vineyard sites, different wineries, to basically steal knowledge from everybody that's been gatekeeping it. Um, so people agreed and we started going on visits for six months out of the year, the entire growing season and we pay our apprentices so they can take time off for every Friday for six months to go learn a necessary skill to find their place in the wine industry no matter where they wanna be, whether it's in the business, uh, legal side, growing grapes, making wine, um, you know, pest management, everything. Um, and this is all because I didn't see this as an opportunity for anyone that looked like me. I was working really hard, working in restaurants, managing restaurants. I didn't have time to do anything else. The pandemic basically saved my life. It basically gave me the opportunity to not have to work for somebody who was taking advantage of me, even though they said they cared about me. So 
we try to do the opposite. We try to give everything away, you know what I mean? This is to make sure that people can go out there and start their own good things, you know? And besides that, we use that farm to also feed that lower income neighborhood and do actual farm to table meals where we give it away completely free. So all we ask is people that have more money to be able to donate what they can so we can keep taking care of other people. Ooh. Crazy, I know, right? When you decide to radical. like not, <laughs> isn't that radical? Um, so, Eric, you, again, dealing that, being that you kind of operate the most conventional, but not even out of all these spaces, how do you move away from not censoring profit in your business? And how do you make sure that your employees and your, the people that are in your community are able to reap that benefit? Um, I, I think one of our earlier uh, panelists, I think Jessica said it too, it's like you, you, you first you figure out what enough is enough for yourself, right? And then once you know what your enough is, then, and you know, what your expectation of, or what you expect out of this business, anything above that, like should you really hoard that, you know, thing that goes beyond your expectation Elon of what enough is enough? You. Or, <laughs> exactly. Um, or do you, you know, just take that and like, hey, look, we as a team did this, so we should all benefit from it, right? So one of the things that uh, we did uh, for our team um, is that, I mean, you know, it's like we, I talked about uh, getting rid of tipping earlier, uh, but what we also did is that, um, so now instead of everyone's weekly wages, like going up and down, it's like fees and famine. Uh, what we did is like, okay, everyone is going to be paid. Right now we have two paying structures. Everyone who works for this company makes 25 bucks an hour. And then if you are a, a manager, dining room manager, kitchen manager, you make five bucks more. But that's not all of it because what we said is like, um, this is your wage. That doesn't mean that your wage can't go up. So what we uh, do call it is this is actually your wage floor, you would never fall below that. Mm -hmm. We got rid of tipping, and uh, instead we uh, implemented a 20%, what we call it, admin fee. And then at that admin fee uh, gets calculated, you know, just like how you usually distribute uh, tipping at the end of the night. Uh, we do it on a weekly basis. If the business does well, everybody gets a bonus. And if weekly, you know, it's like in, in the middle of January <laughs> in New York City, when no one's going out, you know, it's like if they were to share the tips, they would be making like 15, 16 bucks an hour. But we're like, that's not enough. So you're never going to fall below this floor. So you will always have this security um, of that, hey, I know exactly how much I can expect um, every week and never fall below that. But if a business does well, I wear my gases off, you know, like for crazy Friday and Saturday, I should reap some of that benefit because I wear my ass off. Uh, so that's how we kind of, you know, at least build a community within um, our little tiny establishment. So just a sub subset question out of this, because you are based in New York, which is technically considered to be one of the most progressive states in the country um, in regards to the laws that they have for um, employees, uh, especially tipped employees. So technically, like you can't share tips with the back of house, and that's something that you have to like circumvent because otherwise um, your kitchen staff would be making, what, 20% or more or less than your, your front of house staff? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, they would be making a lot more. I mean, I, I think pre-pandemic, uh, before we got rid of the tipping, um, you know, it's, I think typically you can expect people who work in the kitchen to be making any, anywhere between 17 to $19 an hour. And if they were to uh, share the tip pool, a lot of people walk away after a Friday or Saturday night with like $60 an hour. It's just a huge discrepancy, even though we're all on the same team. Um, and, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think one of the, uh, I feel very lucky to be in my position is that because I get to sub in wherever I can. If a dishwasher, you know, calls out, I get to do the dishes all night. If a server calls out, if a cook goes, you know, calls out, I do all those things too. And I and I know how hard they work. You know, someone who is doing dishes like with their hands in <laughs> dirty like dishwater, you know, for ten hours a day, why should they make less than someone, you know, who's working the dining room or a cook? 
Um, so yeah, it's like definitely by removing uh, that tip piece, you, you also get to even it out a little bit more. So I want to come to you, Bianca, because you are on the opposite end of the spectrum. You are in Florida, which Florida, it, by God, <laughs> by God, Florida. Um, Florida. Um, so Florida, and then you are a worker-owned business, which is very rare. And in fact, they probably, like, in the, the laws there are just the wild west. There are none. There are none. <laughs> Zero laws. No laws. Um, and then furthermore, the business that you're trying to own or that you're trying to run and operate is, like, kind of like a direct counterance to what they want to create there. So how do you operate a business that doesn't center profit in a place that is, like, actively hostile? So I think we talked about this before, and this is um, an article that kind of like, well, let me back up for a second. Um, our space, and I say our space, obviously, my partner, Brian, um, his sister, Audrey, our friend, Joseph, like we run this place together. We think about it all the time. We're there all the time. It's kind of like, you know, the forefront of our lives in a really positive way. Um, one of the things that we talked about before, I sent you that piece that like really means a lot to me. Um, it's an article in the New Inquiry. It's an um, online kind of blog, but they write articles and like there's really amazing authors that um, contribute to it pretty regularly. Um, and it's a piece called Not This, More That. Um, and I think that's kind of like how we all sort of operate in general in life where we kind of don't really focus on the thing that's trying to like take our thing away, we're just trying to keep our thing going. So like we're not really focusing on all the things that are trying to like keep us from having conversations or you know, try to make us change our minds as far as like what we want to prioritize, what we want, what we want to do, right? Like what we're, our thing is more of this experiment and questioning what's possible, right? Like, ev like we're constantly changing and we're constantly adapting to, all right, this is working, this isn't really working. We like this, we're making a lot of money here, but we're really exhausted. So maybe we just pivot because this is what's better for us. So really the landscape is just kind of like, you know, personally very difficult to navigate. It's personally like very draining, it's very sad, it's very difficult, but what we're doing is clearly resonating with people. You know, our regulars are some of the best regulars I've ever had anywhere I've ever worked. Like people have cried to me at the register and like that's not something that any sort of fascistic politics can take away, right? Like that can't really be affected by these sort of like, like you said, these sort of like relationship building. Like that's so much more important than anything else. And so it, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a personally like difficult kind of terrain to navigate, but being in the position that we're in, it's kind of like, it's funny because we are this sort of private business that is operating within this like capitalistic structure. They're like, we like, we like small businesses, but y'all are being really annoying right now. Like that's like kind of like what it feels like. So it's like, <laughs> like we're doing the thing they want us to do, but they we're not doing it. And so I think, yeah, so I think that's kind of the way that we can do the the not this more that. Social good is a nuisance. <laughs> um, Chris. Social good is a nuisance. So what is that? You're, you're, you have this farm. It's by, the, it's by the projects. You're growing grapes. You're making food. You're giving food away. And they're just like, we don't get it. Like, why are you doing good, good things? Like, and you don't want to make money? I mean, of course, I would love to make money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it feels as if uh, people don't want to invest in things like that, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's wild to live in one of the wealthiest cities in the country one of the wealthiest cities in the world, and people say they do good, but when you actually see their actions, I think that's the, the thing I'm starting to get drained by, is that people are walking, or not, you know, they're not keeping up with what they say they're trying to do. Um, they're doing a lot of showing, and, and it hurts. It doesn't feel good to have people use you to try and make themselves look better and they ask like, well, what can I do? And it's like, well, I think you kind of know what you can do, you know what I mean? And I use this example of like, if a child was running into the street, you would all probably try and stop the child from getting hit by a car or something, right? But I think when it comes to racism or inequity, people are like, but that's a little too dangerous. And it's like, you would be willing to risk, like literally risk your life to like help some child, you know what I mean? 
that we, you wouldn't even know. But you'd be like, that's not right. But it takes adults to have to be forced to stop doing something that they know is not right. But you wouldn't want it to happen to yourself. So these questions that we keep asking, it's like, is this even necessary? You know, and then people get really upset when people act out, when they do things like break into cars, they steal shit, they, uh, you know what I mean? They do drugs, they feel depressed. And it's like, you gotta look inside and see, am, am I part of this problem too, you know? So I feel like, um, yeah, we really are just trying to uh, be a, a really positive part of our city and show people and be like a, a leader, you know? And if uh, we fundraise, we do all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's also like, I'm not gonna go beg anybody to do the right thing. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think Kevin and I, we were talking about earlier today, it's, okay, so a lot of people are like waiting until the rules change, until the government does something to say, hey, the minimum wage is now this. It's like, but do you really have to wait until that happens to start treating people like people, to start paying them well, right? Okay, boom. I love that. That was amazing. You were like, I'm going to be the most quiet. <laughs> Damn. Fine. Um, so we already know you don't want to make any money, Kevin. You're just trying to... <laughs> you're just trying to keep the lights on, and you're trying to... And, and, and sometimes nobody's home. But the one thing that is really interesting is that you've... You, from my conversations with you, is that you figured out this thing called the ask, which I think is so interesting. And it's... I want you to talk a little bit about what I mean by the ask. Yeah, for us, and this is like Eric referenced, so we were having this conversation that, um, you know, for us, especially in Texas, uh, the, the laws are not good, and they are not going to be good um, anytime soon, it doesn't seem like. Uh, and so we are, uh, you know, taking, working with the businesses here in Austin that are doing great things, that are Jessica, who was up here earlier, um, you know, without being forced to by law, raising her standards. Uh, we have all these businesses offering better benefits, better opportunities for their employees. Um, and for us, it's we, we just go out and ask people to be a part of it. And we go and we reach out to businesses and we say, like, come join our community. There is no, uh, we do not charge dues. Uh, we want you to come in, we want you to learn, we want to connect you with other business owners that are going above and beyond without being uh, required to but they're just trying to make their businesses better, their communities better. Um, and for us, it's we go around and we ask uh, the people who benefit from the service industry to contribute to our organization so that we can provide these trainings. We ask the people who enjoy Austin's restaurants and bars and coffee shops to contribute to our organization so that we can provide better opportunities, better training, safer, healthier workplaces for all the people in them. Uh, and, you know, what is really exciting, I think, about our organization is, uh, I think there's, there's so many ways that this industry overall uh, fails and doesn't do things right. But there are so many people that are doing things, doing great things. And so, uh, and everyone in society participates in this industry. As a consumer, as a worker, it is an entry point for so many young people getting into the workforce for immigrants, coming into our communities. There's so many times that you are coming into this industry. And so we need to make it better. We need to raise the floor uh, of what's allowed in this industry. And we're gonna do it voluntarily if the laws aren't gonna keep up. Uh, and we're gonna you know, just continue to make sure that uh, the people that are doing things better, that are pushing the boundaries, are highlighted, are supported, um, are getting connected to other people joining the industry. Uh, and that's what we do. Like, we want to make sure that, oh, you're starting a place. Like, talk to these people. Go sit in the room with them. Go, you know, go support their business and then and introduce yourself and, you know, be a part of the community. Model the people that are doing the great things. And, and so we really go out and try to make sure everyone feels like they can join and be part of the community. I want to get Chris in, actually, be perfect timing. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I think about the ask a lot, and I think it's something that I've had to become very comfortable with. Um, yeah, one of the best things that, that's happened in the last few years is my friend Julian actually brought me into a gallery space to talk to younger black kids, adults, you know, 20-year-old somethings, 
specifically to talk about ask and how I ask, because I ask for everything, because I feel like I deserve everything, because people take from me all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> like people, people that I work for, things like that, they will ask me to do everything. They will, and then not give me anything for it. You know, so I'm like uh, trying to let people know, it's like, if they can be comfortable, you can be comfortable, you know? And it's like uh, really easy for me to ask because I'm not doing anything wrong with the things that I ask for. I'm asking for the right reasons. So it feels like a superpower. And, and it's literally the worst thing that most people can say is no. But usually what they do is pass you to someone else that'll help you. You know, so I feel like it's something that, like, if we all knew how to just be like, can you help me? Or can I help you? It would be such a better world. Like, so easy. Well, <laughs> you better preach, you heard? Uh, because capitalism just demands. It demands energy. It demands labor. Time which demands time, which is currency. All of those things are currency. And... We talked a lot about alternate forms of currency, you and I, Chris. And so, like, yeah, what, what are these forms of currency that, like, you've been able to, like, through that ask, what have you derived to be a form of currency? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I would say the, <laughs> y'all are going crazy over there. Um, <laughs> the, the currency that I feel from my community and the people around me um, has been love, the energy, the positivity. Uh, things that make you wake up in the morning, even though the world's going to shit. It's, it's awesome to feel really happy about people caring about you. That is currency. Um, Steve Mathiason, the shirt that I'm wearing, this man has given his time for the last few years to actually do the work. He shows up. He, uh, he is seriously one of the like most childish in a good way. Like he's I don't know, it's funny, he doesn't see bad shit happen. He's just like, oh, I didn't notice that, you know what I mean? Like, he's like, oh, cool, yeah, I would love to do that for you, you know what I mean? Where like, some other people in his position would be like, I'm not touching that, that'll fuck up my reputation. Where he's like, I don't care. He's like, I'm just growing grapes and making wine. Matt Neese, the guy who's helping us put out our wine legally, he's giving us the opportunity to really be able to get bottles to you know, work with my friend who's done the label two years in a row to be able to get this wine in people's hands all around the world, you know what I mean? To be able to show other people of color that like, hey, if you put yourself around good people and they care about you, you can make anything happen. Imagine if it was somebody that worked at Tesla. Imagine if it was somebody that worked at, you know what I mean? These people all could be doing this. So I'm very happy to see this kind of currency happening. And these dudes, these, Women like Beth Forestrell, she's giving me the keys to UC Davis. I don't go to school, you know what I mean? I don't have a college degree, but I go to college. It's crazy. I get other people of color into college, literally. Like, we are stealing, but it's a good way, you know what I mean? Like, it's already oh, yeah. been paid for. It's already there. The information's there, yep. you know what I mean? So it's like to force people to have to think of currency as money, I don't need to participate in it. As long as I have a roof over my head, my kids are safe, my partner's fine, I'm good, people aren't trying to hurt me, I don't really need much more. I would like to have nice things, but like at the same time, I'm not gonna, what, take it with me? Yeah. Bianca. Yeah, happy to jump in. You are such an inspiration, my God. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I've talked a lot about access and I think that's something that's still kind of like at the forefront for me because I think about what, what that even means because I feel like access is kind of like a little bit of a heavy word but it could mean so many different things. You've obviously been talking a lot about access and sharing it with other people, resources and being able to kind of like be in a position and say, hey, I'm, I'm here, what do you need? That's such a big thing that we talk about a lot in the wine industry and business kind of like in any sort of way that that sort of access to get to another place and not the gatekeeping is a big thing. I also think about access of space and being in a space that you feel is like not yours. We've obviously talked about imposter syndrome and being like, I'm not sure I am this, I'm good enough to be here, I should be here, I can afford to be here, all these sorts of things. But you know, our space being this sort of hybrid space where we have the food aspect and we have the books aspect and the wine and the outdoor space and the event space. It's kind of like people who wouldn't normally cross paths are now meeting each other. 
I want to make sure that you remember to mention too that you provide a space that is accessible, both um, like ADA accessible in a lot of ways. Also, you create a space for like non-beverage things to happen, even though this wine is our lens for connection. In, for all of us, I feel, most of us here, but you create a space that like has knitting practices, has like conversations about sobriety and other things, and you know, it's not just singularly focused. Yeah, I think, and I mean, we attach this to our conversation about natural wine and what that means. A lot of us are natural wine um, professionals, and for myself, you know, there's so many different definitions, but it's also this sort of conduit in thinking about what else is possible. <laughs> If you think about what natural wine is, and there's a sort of like gray definition that we don't really have this sort of like stronghold understanding of, but like as close to it as we can get, and we know what it mean, what it's not, like we can kind of understand natural wine with what it isn't. We can kind of use that as the same lens for like, okay, this is a business. What is possible? What can I do? Where can I push the boundaries? Where can I go? And for us, obviously, with that access of being able to have wine people and knitting people having a conversation of being like, oh, I'm gonna get this great bottle. We even, we've, our friend hosts um, a really adorable kind of like knitting group and they meet every Sunday. And from that group has stemmed like some people who are kind of like, this wine thing, what is it about? I, you, y'all seem excited about this. And I'll be like, yes, come over here. I'm gonna talk to you about it. Now they come to the wine tasting every month and now they're kind of like, I think I can, I think I can get into this. I don't know. I think I can make this. A th and watching people in real time feel like this is a place where I feel like I can do that and know that they're going to meet other people who are willing to put them in a position to do well in whatever it is they want to do, I think is just a really, I think it's a really fun thing to do. Can I say one more thing to that? So you, space, Just talking about space, uh, an actual really interesting thing happened with Steve Mathiasen at a... Um, Iman, what's the place called in Napa? The white fancy winery? Ashes, Ashes and Diamonds. So Ashes and Diamonds, they had a... They Perfect had a, name for a rich fancy white uh, face. <laughs> they had this, uh, this talk on sustainability with a lot of wealthy people there. A lot of fancy things going on. Lots of expensive wines. And I showed up early and it felt awkward. I felt this this sinking feeling of not supposed to, like I wasn't supposed to be there. And it really felt that way when this door opened and Carlo Mandavi popped out, uh, Diana Snowden, some other people. And then I was sitting there and they talked to me and then they were like, oh, we're gonna go back in the room. And then Steve popped out and he was like, oh, hey. I was like, oh shit, what's up, dude? And he was like, wait, what are you doing? He was like, come here. And he literally brought me into the room, the physical room where the expensive wine was, where the cheese was, where pate was. And Steve gave me a glass and he asked the guy to pour me wine. And then I drank the wine and then it was amazing. <laughs> and then I remember later on in the evening when it didn't feel amazing anymore, you know what I mean? At one point, they gave me that look. Steve didn't see it, but the other people gave me that look and they were like, you're not supposed to be here. Mm. It was fucked up, yeah. but Steve like, I'm telling you, he did the right thing. He was like, I'm going to literally open this door, let you in, and I don't care. It was amazing. I was like, wow. That guy just, he didn't even think about it. He was just like, what do you mean you're not going to come drink wine with me? Like, what's up, dude? I know you. You're in Napa. Like, what else would you be doing, you know? Ooh. Yeah. Steve with Dyson, we're thinking of you, baby. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> Send me wine. Uh, <laughs> Eric, so actually, perfect so your your Costa Valley is a California based store. Like now it's in New York, but as in all of the wine is from California, yeah, and it has represents them, yeah. most of them is and but it, and it represents. But again, your decision is what seventy five wines by the glass right now. Right now it's seventy five. Seventy five yeah. wines. So all of them, everything you get to taste everything. Access another form of currency is access and education. Right. Let's talk about how you do that. Um, I mean, we, it really. All thanks to um, Coravin. <laughs> uh, it, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I bought a Coravin when it first came out. I was just like, oh my God, this is going to change everything. And it's because um, Coravin was invented that I realized that you can actually taste everything before you actually commit because you can preserve a lot of the wines without spoiling them. Um, so yeah, I mean, access is absolutely important. Uh, you know, you got the three groups of people, right? It's like the customer. Um, they absolutely need that access. Um, yeah, because you know, it, it really just, it's already pretentious enough and hard to get into. And then 
I think the, the, the biggest reason that I want to make sure that people can taste everything is because, you know, we were talking about like, hey, was there a aha, mo a, a, an, an aha moment for you, uh, you know, that you fell in love with wine? But, you know, I told you, it's like, it was actually kind of a aha location, you know, because I was living in Napa, working in Napa, going wine tasting every weekend, was able to taste and develop my palate and fall in love with wine. So if I, if I played the role of a gatekeeper, it's like, hey, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna spend 20 minutes talking to you about the palate, the nose and everything, uh, but without letting you taste it, then you're never going to fall in love with wine. You know, you fall in love with wine by just simply tasting it. Mm -hmm. So by allowing people to taste, you're creating an, a social investment. And then the social investment is another form of currency that then allows us to continue the work in regards to creating more access. So just circling back to that ask, I don't want to forget about that just one more time. So Kevin, you know, you're working with hospitality businesses in Austin. Um, for those of us who are here visiting that are, don't live in Austin, um, I've noticed that there is a lot of social inequity in the city and there's, it's, it's a huge problem like that what the, everywhere it's not just one place like I went to like one of the high, most highly regarded restaurants in the city and I experienced like an altercation between somebody who was not of means and somebody who is of means in the city and what that creates so you're actively trying to dismantle this or you know at least work on it through so through creating um good work so yeah I mean there's a number of things we try to do and one it's uh uh, every single business within the industry can access the services we provide at our organization. And if you want to contribute to it, if you want to do a joint fundraiser or whatever, you can, but you do not have to. Like, you can come in and access everything. Uh, from the, we are a fast-growing city. There are a lot of people being left behind in Austin, and uh, we want to make sure... Uh, we think restaurants have a cool part to play, or cool, maybe right, wrong word. We think the restaurants have a very important uh, role to play in trying to make this better. Uh, at their core, they feed people. Uh, in the pandemic, we had a bunch of uh, restaurants that were either closed or maybe doing a little bit of takeout, or, but said uh, kids used to go to school and get two meals a day, and now they're at home. Uh, we have shelters, we have encampments, we have... Uh, all kinds of these things. So how do we safely put a couple of people in this kitchen and prepare meals? And you can leave your dining room empty. Uh, you can make enough money to pay your rent, pay these people to make meals. We'll raise money. We'll go to the government and secure contracts, do all these things so that uh, we can put these places to use doing good. Um, and it's not solving all of the problems, but we're going to make sure that we're contributing as a community with the, the tools that we have, with the kitchens that we have, with the skills, the knowledge, the expertise, uh, and, and try to help out other people. Uh, we're going to try to raise the standards of the industry so that when people are able to go in and get jobs, they are safe in their workplace. They're not gonna get harassed. They're not gonna get abused. Uh, they are gonna have access to the certain non-financial, they're gonna, they're gonna have a good wage, but also the other forms of currency that you need mental health resources. Uh, we've got partners that, that do that, and we're gonna make sure you're connected to them. All of those things to try to, to elevate, um, you know, what this industry can and should provide besides going out and getting an incredible meal, and, and you know, there's so much more that the industry can do to support the community as a whole. That's amazing. All right, so we've got like maybe like five minutes left. I want to make sure that we briefly down the line give two tangibles that you can that people can walk away with today that they can put into their lives. And then we're going to open it up for a couple questions and then wrap up. So starting with you, Eric, two tangibles. Um, yeah, I would say definitely the, the, the first one is ask yourself like what your enough is, mm -hmm. um, right? And then if it's possible uh, that if the outcome exceeds your enough, can you share it? Um, and um, yeah, I, w I would also say um, another thing would be to go through your business model and figure out where all the people are. There are so many components to it, supplier, employees, customers. Figure out who the people are in your entire business model and figure out uh, for each of those roles how you can uplift the people. Chris. 
I just had it and then it went away. Um, let's see. So one of the things I was thinking was, I was talking about it last night with a few friends. I think uh, it sounds funny, but a questionnaire, you know? If you had a questionnaire and you had people that needed something, write down what they needed. And then if you can get that for them or give it to them, then you guys talk. If you can't, you might leave them alone or pass them to someone else. Um, another thing that I think is if you own a business in your city and you really want to help, talk with your staff, think about it. What's one thing you could do maybe starting one day a month that you can give back to your community that isn't going to take from you but will come back to you, you know what I mean, with different currency, that people know about it. They want to support you because you're supporting your community. You know what I mean? It may sound selfish, but it's also like that's the right kind of give and pull, you know. Bianca, um, I'll keep it pretty brief and pretty succinct. I think the first thing, um, before thinking about anything else, is kind of like as operating as a business, what is your goal? What is your, first and foremost, what is your goal right now? Then to kind of like bring it back to the social good, I would say if you're trying to incorporate social good or social sustainability in your business, what would that goal look like? And kind of like see the two. See if they match up, see if they don't match up, see the difference between them. Kevin. Tangible things, I think number one is really like uh, know your business. If you're a business owner, you're operating a business and it's, uh, it doesn't have to be what is in the textbook of running a business or whatever. It can be, this is, this is knowing you're enough, it's knowing how, it, how your business can be sustainable so that you can focus on the things that really matter but making sure you understand the financial component of it uh, so that you can focus on the things that you're excited about. Um, and the other thing, it's sort of a story uh, Chris told, and, and I don't know Steve Mathiasen. I'm not quite a, I'm totally in the wine world. Um, but take people with you. Um, when you are doing something good and you are building something meaningful, um, open the door behind you uh, and take people with you. And that's... Yep. Absolutely. That's what we try to build in our organization. Yep. Yeah, man. Exactly. All right, so we've got probably time for like maybe one or two questions. Maybe, do we, do we have time for one or two questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we have time for one or two questions. Three questions. <laughs> questions, anyone? Comments, concerns? <laughs> Feedback? Hi. Oh. Uh, Miguel, did you see who raised their hand first? All right, can you guys hear me? <laughs> um, well, thank you for being here. I've heard some really incredible uh, perspectives and ideas and ways of being. Um, I had a question about kind of how you guys would recommend business owners navigating inflation and cost of living increases. These are really challenging conversations that we have to navigate, and I'm interested to hear y'all's perspective. I would say it depends on what type of business you're running. Um, yeah, it's funny. It's like, I mean, I wouldn't consider what I'm doing a business right now. I mean, it is, but I'm also in the, I would say I'm in the business of trying to give as much away as I can. Like, I would like to be able to one day be able to do that when I have money, too. You know, so if I start now, that practice will continue. Um, but yeah. Um, this has been one question I've had a lot over the last, whatever it's been, a year, that, you know, this has been happening. I mean, it, it is, it's hard to, to have the advice be raise your prices, and I think it's, that's why it's understand your business, because there is, there is a time when price increases are required, and there's a lot of labor that goes into producing the ingredients that you're using and all of these things. So, uh, you know, that's... That's part of it, but it's also just understanding all of the true costs and understanding, uh, you know, it's, for me, it's like I tell people support the businesses where the owner is on site every day and is working and those kinds of businesses because they are they are able to um, absorb some of those things in a different way, but it's, it's a super hard one right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I would say it's like definitely, it, it's, 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 it, again, it, it, it sounds like the solution is going to be a little complicated because it involves math, right? But I think the, the overall idea is that um, when prices do go up, then you can figure out where you can win some and lose some. 
So you might be able to increase the prices where, um, I'll just use like our wine list as an example. It's like I might increase uh, wine prices where the prices are a lot higher because the people who can afford those wines, they wouldn't care if they have to pay like five, ten dollars extra. But then that will make up the difference for you continue to keep the prices lower on the lower end. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not simple, um, but I think it involves some math. <laughs> I'm going to jump in real quick very shortly. Like, obviously, I think having those sorts of questions or, you know, what do I do or what should I do? Um, I think ultimately kind of piggybacking what everyone else said, but also um, providing some sort of transparency, I think, is always helpful when you do have to make a decision for your business and you know that you have the best intentions being transparent about price increases, being transparent about where your food is coming from and if you're owning you know, a food establishment, it's kind of like, where did that increase come from? I think gives people an understanding of, you know, this isn't just some void of an establishment where I'm expecting X, Y, and Z. Like there's a very clear reason why, you know, A to B would be my opinion. All right, folks, well, of course we went out of time because there's, a, there's no other way it would be if I had a panel. We just talk too much. Uh, but I just want to say thank you very much for the participants on site. Thank you to the people that are tuning in. Thank you to Jade, to Justine, to Giuliani from Anything But Vinifera. And uh, thank you to Assemblage and uh, the Lyft Collective for having us for this conversation. And yep. uh, make sure that you guys take care of each other. Thank you. Great. Let's keep it going, everybody, for this panel. Roxy, Kevin, Bianca, Eric, and Chris, thank you so much.